What's, What's up, up, guys? It's, it was good. It's Terry and Rowan from Artismart TV bringing you another episode of the HC Economics, Economics Review. Review. What now, are we covering in this episode, Terry? So today we're going to be looking uh, at inflation, and it's a very, very special episode uh, because it's actually one of the essays which we predicted. If you haven't seen our HC 2022 predictions video, it is going somewhere here. Um, uh, yeah, so we're predicting that it's going to be one of our essays. So I think it's very, very important that we actually get a chance to talk about some of the trends, some, what's been happening with inflation, so you can use that in your essay. Awesome. So let's get right into it. Let's not muck about. Let's start with what on earth is happening with just the, the trends and the data for inflation to start with, <laughs> right? Which is, there's a lot yeah. of noise, there's a lot of mess here. But let's just start with the fact that our July quarter, like, so our, sorry, our, like the final quarter that we have, right? Yeah. So that's the June 2022 quarter, yeah. right? That saw a 1.8% rise in CPI for the quarter, and that mm-hmm. took CPI over the year to 6.1%. Yeah. So I think it's actually, again, I want to point this out. So I did the same thing for economic growth video. Like the way that these stats work is that when you look at that 6.1% number, that's just comparing to that same quarter. Yeah last year so when you're comparing over those 12 months how much have prices increased now it's still a lot right yeah right so that's how because so, sometimes it can get confusing why is it sometimes 1.8 why is it 6.1 because yeah. the 1.8 is just for that three month period which yeah. is a lot that's a lot right because yeah. you think about if that's for four quarters a year that's, that's like, like eight, yeah <laughs> almost eight percent my math is not great but it's almost there that's right? a lot of inflation yeah, yeah. so i like, it's still a lot so you look at one because like, often you look at 1.8 it doesn't seem like that much yeah. but you know it, when you annualize been, it, yeah, yeah, definitely. annualize, yeah, it's been terrible, yeah. <laughs> terrible, terrible, terrible. So, yeah, just the thing to know, right, is I just want to sort of um, move a, a little bit before we dive into what this means and what's driving this inflation, right? What is interesting is that's a quarterly figure, right? The ABS has now moved to monthly reporting, okay? This is new, okay? They only have started it really in like June, July, August, right? And they've moved to it because the figure is moving so quickly. Right to really make good economic policy decisions, the government and economic you know organisations, RBA and the like, are needing better data and more up to date data. So if we quickly pause for a moment and we go, well, what's been happening in like the recent couple of months? Right, we can see that there's a bit of flux going on here. Right, so we saw that it was six point eight percent in August compared to seven percent in July compared to 6.8% oh in June. <laughs> so we're getting it like jumping around a little yeah. bit here between the 68 to 7%, okay? And ultimately that slight fall that we saw from 7 to 68 um, is a result simply of just some of the decrease in prices of automotive fuel, okay? So um, this is gonna be new monthly reporting. So if you're you know, a HSA economic student, pay attention, right? You can get monthly data now for inflation. Um, and note what they're going to do though is they're only going to cover 60 to 70 percent of the goods in the ABS CPI index every month because it's just quite a task, right, to be collating this data. Um, so in some respects, it's probably a bit of a trimmed mean, right? They're all the trimmed. Yeah, <laughs> just pulling that one out, right? Yeah. <laughs> just casually, yeah. <laughs> Where they're excluding, you know, the top 15, bottom 15 percent, right? If you think about it, if they're including 70 percent. That's thirty percent left over, so I'm expecting that they're excluding top fifteen, bottom fifteen. Yeah. So even even though even though we're still getting, even having said that, we're still getting six point eight percent annualized inflation, which is so, significant. So mate, it's it's, it's pretty it's grim. Yeah. That's right. So now let's let's jump back. Let's look at we're looking at you know six point one over the year, yeah. right? From you know June twenty twenty two, right? But at the moment, the more recent data is showing six point eight, right? What's some of the most significant areas where we're seeing this price increase? Okay, so first, first of all, we've got uh, just new dwelling purchases, right? The cost of that a new, a new, a new property uh, for owner occupiers, so not even for people investing yeah. in property, five point six percent. This one should be no surprise for anybody. Automotive fuel, four point two percent, and this one could be a surprise for me because I don't buy a lot of it. But furniture at seven yeah. percent. But look, I think one of the interesting things that driving certainly both the new dwelling purchases and for owner occupier and the furniture. Shipping. Is shipping, yeah. right? Like the price of shipping containers is just like exploded. And so really we're looking at the, the consequences of those like global supply chain issues and the logistical problems, right? That sort of emerge from there. Um, and so I think we can see that come here. Now, look, if we do look at the trimmed mean, right? Um, and this is the RBA's data on the trim mean where they exclude those large price rises and falls. It's still 4.9%. Yeah, which is higher than we've had in like years, really. It's, 
ever yeah. since they started publishing it, oh, in fact. Right? Yeah, there you so go, you're there. right. Yeah, okay, I, didn't, I didn't see that part, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now, what's particularly interesting is, yes, goods accounted for 79% of the CPI rise in the last quarter. So if we just look at the most recent quarter, right, 79%, and that was because of those high freight costs that we've talked about. That's because of fuel, mm. right, as well as shipping containers, and then the supply constraints um, that are also key. I want to touch on another video which yeah. we just filmed, Ron. So we actually talked about like um, consumption, and a lot of that was coming from services. I wonder yeah. if that's almost like a substitution effect that people are looking at the fact that goods have been such such a big component of price increases that they have decided, you know what, I'd rather spend my money on going out with the boys or the girls, <laughs> right? And so they've just gravitated instead to services instead of goods. Yeah, possibly, so, right? So I, th- I guess I just want to point that out because it might just show a bit of an effect of that's this right. inflation. Yeah. yeah, and it does. It distorts decision-making. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, that's one of the effects of inflation in an economy, right? It distorts how we think about the purchases, not just in terms of what we buy, but when we buy, right? In terms of time as well. So I think if we keep diving in, um, you know, look, dwelling prices recorded the highest, largest annual rise um, since the 1990 quarter when they started it. And again, um, you know, you see stories about this in the media where, you know, people have signed a contract to buy a house and the builders having to make it, but they're now making it 12 months later and the prices oh, yeah. have changed that they're losing money on it. Right. So yeah. we're seeing that occur. We're seeing stories and we've, of course, seen like the, the you know, the fuel excise um, you know, that made a difference um, and that's, you know, saw the prices fall, but that's now gone. Yeah. You know, so we're going to start to see that flow back in to the inflation data over the next yeah. couple of months. Yeah. So if you saw, you know, people lining up for petrol and you're like, why are they lining up at the end of, end of this month? It was big. Like, yeah. End of September, sorry. Huge line. Huge line. <laughs> yeah. Did you pay for it? I didn't. I didn't either. But yeah, if you saw that, that was because that fuel excise yeah. was now in, uh, not being halved anymore and they were actually going to yeah. go back. So to again, it. you can see how prices are changing decision making through time. It's a really great little example of that. Absolutely. So if you sort of take a look, right, um, quite interestingly, um, you know, uh, the the main areas that we've seen those prices, we've sort of highlighted, but particularly you see housing, uh, you see transport being the bigger drivers, right, because of these factors. Now, sort of diving in, I think what's pretty interesting here is we should look at um, very briefly, right, we can see that we've got a combination of things going on causing inflation, right? Like one, we've got those global supply shortages yeah. okay we've got freight costs we've got fuel costs and fuel costs are in part influenced by the, the war in ukraine as well and so clearly if we look at inflation that is a big driver right in terms of what has been occurring but we're also seeing you know just broadly um you know like strong strong demand economic growth was at 3.9 percent mm-hmm. okay yeah um you know so we're also seeing some demand pull inflation gonna, okay. yeah that's what i was gonna say yeah yeah, yeah. So um, I guess to, to go to that, Terry, like, um, you know, I guess stepping back, we've got, and this is, I guess, a good thing to sort of go to the basics for inflation, right? We've got some demand pull occurring. We've got a bunch of cost push occurring. And a lot of that's imported inflation yeah. um, because it's coming from overseas. And the dollar is going to exacerbate that a little oh, bit yeah. because the dollar is a lot lower at the moment. So it's going to mean that we're going to see ongoing price rises from overseas, which is also going to play an interesting impact over the next six months for inflation. Um, How does this all play out though then from a a perspective of like wage growth and real wages? Okay, well, I I want to say wage growth, right? Because, you know, you obviously, when we have these conversations, we need to consider the fact that you have nominal wage increases versus real wage increases, right? right? And so nominally, had it been a different time, right? Had it been a different time, this would have been what we we're looking for for years, right? Yep. This was the when you know the nominal wages started to pick up. So you, so you can look at the numbers, you know, throughout I guess through twenty twenty, uh, they got down to lows of one point four percent per in a quarter, and then now we're actually all the way back up two point six percent. And we've actually you know we've been waiting so long for you know over two percent. Yeah, wage I growth. mean that's right. In any right. other time, yeah. you'd be like hell yeah, <laughs> great, yeah, right, like right on, right where we want it to be. Yeah. Um, and the reason, you know, you want wage growth is that it drives, you know, it, well, it's going to it's gonna support hopefully real wage growth, which yeah. we're going to look at. Yeah. And then that supports ultimately the level of consumption in the economy, which as Terry highlighted yeah. um, in a prior video is 60% of, you know, 
percent of, of sort of the main driver. It's probably going to be a bit more than that yeah. now since you know business investment's been so weak. So, so weak. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. So, so the split between private sector and public sector, we've got private sector at two point seven percent, as we could probably expect. You know, mm-hmm. like they did have, a, they they often do have a little bit more, you know, capacity yeah. and, and flexibility to bargain for those wages. Public sector is not far behind though at two point four percent. So as I said, in normal year this would have been good, right? But when you factor in inflation. Uh, that's where we start to run into issues yeah, because right. real wages have actually fallen, right, three point five percent over the past year. So the year that we have, the, the, you know, the best nominal wage increase in mm. forever. Yeah, that's right. Is I mean, when, when we just get destroyed by yeah, inflation. That's right. Crazy. So if you haven't put it together, basically, you get your real inflation by taking a nominal inflation and subtracting inflation from it. Yes, that's right. You mean your nominal wage growth and subtracting inflation. Yes. You know what? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but yes, that's correct. I distorted my thing. Yes, inflation. <laughs> inflation <laughs> having that effect already. <laughs> so look, yeah. just to put this in context, right? Like real wages are now at 2011 to 2012 oh levels, right? So in other words, you know, you, you've almost basically due to inflation, this is the problem with inflation, right? Yeah. Is that particularly when you get inflation out of, out of control or at least aggressive inflation occurring, it can wipe off a decade, which is literally what it's done, of real wage growth, right? Like that. Like we're talking about six months to wipe off a decade of, of, of real wage growth. It's just insane when you put it that way. And it, um, and, it, and it never goes back up the other way, right? You can always wipe it off like that, but then it doesn't, it, it doesn't well, shoot yeah, up like that. It doesn't shoot up that yeah, way. Exactly. It it's a much off. slower progression <laughs> to get back up, yeah. but it wipes much quicker, so right? Like, you know, one step forward and like yeah. 10 steps back. And you can certainly see that if you look at, you know, real wages like in terms of the index, right? You really see that, you know, it, it, it does reach, a, you know, a high in sort of 2020 and then literally from then it's been falling off a cliff, right? And that's not because wages have been going backwards. It's because inflation has been accelerating throughout this period. So to highlight a couple of things, the, you know, the, the fall that we've had over the, the last year is greater than the fall when the GST was introduced in 2000, okay? Um, so real wages now are 3.6% below where they were at the start of the pandemic. The Reserve Bank predicts they're going to fall even further. I mean, you know, with inflation set to, to get close to 8%, right, um, by the end of the year, wages are expected, um, you know, to, to just continue, unfortunately, real wages to fall over this year. So... Um, you know, overall, it's um, not a great outcome. No. Yeah, if my right. math is correct, that kind of mean, that that implies that we're going to have about five percent. You know, by loss. the end of the year, you yeah. potentially could right. Yeah, if we're already at three and a half percent, that's exactly it. And then that that creates longer term consequences, which is why there are real fears globally of a recession. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And whether or not Australia falls into that boat, you know, there's a whole lot of domestic factors that are going to you know going to be the make or break. But you look at it and there's a lot of concerns at the moment for, um, you know, the UK, right? I mean, that isn't helped by some economic policy there, but that's a whole other yeah. story. Yeah, I was just going to, I was actually just going to go and talk mm. about, you know, on the topic of a recession, you know, yeah. you look at what's going on in other countries, ours isn't even the worst that no. we've got, right? Like, you you know, I, my example I was going to use was Turkey, yeah. right? Oh, their their yeah. inflation's just, you know, like, it's just completely like, off the charts, Off right? the charts and then their, their currency has been completely just destroyed. Yeah, it's been devalued. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, we shouldn't laugh about that. No, we shouldn't, no, right? Because no. it's, it's, you know, the stories that are coming out of Turkey are, are scary, right? When you see the impact that inflation can have. Mm. And so you're right. You look at it and you go, well, you know, yes, at the moment, Australia's economic growth, 3.9, amazing. You look at it, uh, you know, Australia's unemployment rate at, at all-time lows, right? On the face of it, you're like, great. But when you dig underneath, right, you start to go, well, all of that can be very quickly unwound, right, over the course of a 12 to 18 month period with high levels of inflation, right? Simply because they're going to erode real wages, it's going to dampen consumer confidence, consumer spending is going to fall off a cliff, and then uh, you know, you're going to see that issue where you're then going to start to see upward pressure on employment, downward pressure on economic growth. Yeah, Rowan, I'm just going to borrow your years of living, <laughs> right, in this moment. Yeah. Because um, you have been alive a little bit longer than I have. Yeah. Um, when you have those periods where you recover from a higher period of inflation, mm. does that then end up like actually leading to prices dropping back down or do they just kind of stay where they were? No, it's quite, it's, sticky, it's quite sticky. Yeah, it's quite sticky, right? Now, short of, you know, the Coles ads claiming everything's down, down, <laughs> right? Or, you know, I'll be like, sure, there are instances where depending on the market structure, and this is a bit of micro, you know, micro reform coming in, right? Depending on the market structure, there are examples where, 
you know, the price of bread or the price of milk today is genuinely cheaper than it might have been, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Equally, you could argue due to the rise of, you know, like your Kmarts and your low cost foreign production for a bunch of things. There are plenty of examples throughout the economy where there are things that are lower cost. What I would say is um, there are many industries, particularly service-based industries, because of the cost of labor yeah. playing a key role, where you don't see prices go down. They no. just plateau and they remain sticky. Yeah, That's right. Yeah. So unfortunately, there's not going to be a moment where everyone universally just says, okay, inflation's over, let's bring our prices back yeah. down. No, unfortunately, that's not. right. Exactly. So that, that's, and that's why it hurts so much, because once it's already happened, you, know, we already, you talked about you can undo all that progress, but you can't then undo the undoing mm-hmm. of the progress. That's right. right. You can't get it back. That's it. So guys, <clears throat> there you have like a little bit of a, an, an unpack of, okay, some of the drivers that are occurring over inflation in the Australian economy right now, a bit of a, an up-to-date deep dive on, you know, the, the sort of yeah. stats and the state of inflation. What we would say um, is remember that the predicted question we had was a component of it was also about the policy oh, response, yeah. okay? And so we maybe quickly we can highlight a couple yeah. of things, right, that we think you should highlight. But no, we will have a separate video in particular where we're going to do a deep dive on monetary policy because on the face of it, monetary policy is one of the biggest levers, um, certainly that you know you can pull to navigate and control inflation. And so we will be doing a deep dive on that. So stay tuned for that video. But bringing back to this video, Terry, what are some of the policy responses and options that students should be looking at when they discuss this? So I'll talk about what my students mostly talk about. The the, first, the number one one was the fuel excise. Mm-hmm. Like that, that, that was halved from 44 cents per litre uh, to 22 cents per litre for from, I think it was from March to September. Yeah. Right, so... That's a six month period. <laughs> yeah, math, math is not our strong suit, guys. Okay, so that was a six month period. Um, so that's probably the big one that my students were talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, they were also you're also very welcome to talk about the um, addressing of inflation during the deflationary kind of period. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can talk about you know all the stuff you you talk about with with COVID, job keeper, job seeker, all that stuff is fair game. Um, I think it actually does add to your kind of analysis because because you well, you've got to compare yeah, a contrast. Yeah, exactly, there, right? and that's what that does for you. It gives you a low inflation period and now a high inflation period. So you you've basically covered all bases. Yeah, so. and then that means that you can also more interestingly evaluate policy response across the two as well, mm-hmm. right? So definitely, there's a load there in terms of both. I think particularly during um, you know the the low inflationary environment, right? You know, yes, you've got the fiscal response being very significant, right? And, you know, as Terry said, job keeper, job seeker, et cetera, right? You've also got um, some stuff around like childcare and reducing like the cost of childcare, temporarily making it, uh, you know, free um, as well that sort of contributed to lower inflationary pressure during that period. And then, of course, you've got, in you know, monetary policy during that period, which was a very different approach to monetary policy now, yeah. right? You know, monetary policy during that period rates, you know, basement, uh, you know, quantitative easing in terms of bond purchases, which we'll explain more in a separate video, yeah. right? And now you've got rapid rate rises. Yeah, yeah, because like, you know, just to prove we're not a bunch of economics nerds, use a sports analogy, it's almost like a tale of two halves, really. Yeah. And it's important that you do address both halves. I think, as Ron said, that you can really build some very good quality, deep analysis That's and right. evaluation. Yeah, without a doubt. Now, the one thing that you should consider throughout of this, and, and to some extent, that's where, you know, the fuel excise plays an interesting sort of mid sort of intersection is the role of like micro reform and aggregate supply, particularly in, in inflation, right? So, you know, fuel is one of, you know, like it, it's, a, it's a cost of production. It was creating cost push inflation, right? And some of the ways that you might deal with cost push inflation in an economy um, you know, tend to be looking at, well, aggregate supply. What are things that we need to do to support supply in the economy? Um, and in some cases, that might be reducing, you know, excises, subsidizing, right? In the case of childcare, right? And trying to increase access to childcare. So all I would say is don't ignore the micro reform, aggregate Absolutely. supply component, um, because there is some stuff in there, even if it's going to be a smaller part of your response, and it will be, yeah. putting it in there is going to add value. And I will say just on that point about microeconomic reform, a lot of the students that have written stuff for me, they will use stuff from like way back, yeah. right? Yeah. So maybe give your micro reform a bit of a, a, bit refresh. Of a refresh, you know, as Ron was saying, stuff like, you know, childcare, more recent labor mm. market reforms, definitely yeah. throw those in there. And I think that's it. Remember that <clears throat> often I think where students struggle with this is they go, oh, but it was in the budget. 
right? You know, like it was a budget announcement, right? Like, right. oh, that, that's, that's a macro policy. And yeah, sure, like an, an expenditure outcome is going to have a macro policy implication. But a lot of the time, the budget also has microeconomic policies within Absolutely, it, right? Yeah. As in, because at the end of the day, micro is an aggregate supply focused policy. Mm-hmm. So you've got to remember that. Um, and so don't just think, yeah, okay, I've just gone to my textbook and it's got some older examples and I'll use those because, yeah, they're not really going to fly. Yeah. So you do have to kind of think think for yourself here because, and you know what, if you're not sure, check with your teacher. Yeah, that's or, right. Or leave a comment for us. Yeah, exactly. Leave a comment as well. Brilliant, guys. So that is our bit of dive down on inflation, um, the current state of it, and some of the ways you should think about a policy response in your essays. If you have any questions, yeah. let us know below. But also make sure that you hit subscribe and stay tuned for when we release our video on monetary policy. Because obviously, that's a big component and tool that's going to be used to fight inflation in the economy. Until next time, guys.